Everybody, it's Tyler here at Kettering Kickoff, checking team number 2451. Ponage coming in from Illinois. This team really is a complete package. Help me speak more about this row, by the way. I have Elena, Graham, and Aiden. And Ponage here every single year has just been building phenomenal machines. Uh, you know, it's a machine, you look at it, and it looks complex, but honestly, the what's gone into it is just efficient in many cases. So, of course, we'll follow that full cargo journey through the robot, uh, talk about uh, some unique features, especially with their uh, turret area and some of their indexing area, and, of course, their climber coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. First updates now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Continue your excitement of robotics at Kettering University with their combat robotics team and first center. Turn your robotics experience into a professional career. Find out more and get your application started at kettering.edu slash apply. If you're a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many FIRST alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. Elena, let's start out with that cargo path. Talk to me about your intake there. you got a couple of different uh, types of wheels, super wide as well, too. What's gone into it? So basically, starting off with our intake, we decided that we wanted to be, we wanted it to be like um, able to grab it and immediately take control of the, the ball. So we started off with the idea of having both compliant wheels and mechanism wheels. Um, the deal here is that we wanted to space them out pretty far. So initially, our the ball would reach the compliant wheels, grab them in, and be vectored into our conveyor serializer area. Um, our intake is. Um, released by pneumatics and we have chains to keep it from overextending and we have these pretty cool passive clips that keep the intake um, down far enough so that it won't hit the turret when we're um, playing the game. When you're looking at the uh, from a challenge wise you guys might have the widest intake in all of RC I've seen uh, having a compliant intake like that what kind of testing did you do to make sure that you're not gonna have any issues with that sort of thing? Um, we initially started with a smaller intake it was made of aluminum so it's pretty big and bulky but um, after a while we found out we had specific areas that wouldn't catch the cargo as well so we decided to increase our intake to make it much easier for our driver to, to drive as like driver ease is one of our priorities when building our machines. Um, yeah, but from there on, speaking of driver ease, we have a lot of we have a lot of sensors in this area. We have a camera to so the driver can see what's going on from the intake point of view. We have over here um, distance sensors, two of them, and color sensors. So basically, based on what color we are, and in this case we're blue, we'll reject the other color ball. So the ball will come in over here. And if the sen it'll be first picked up by the distance sensors, like these red dots, and then the color sensors. If the color sensors are like, hey, this is the wrong color, we have a little pneumatic piston over here, and it'll push this flipper up and kick the ball out to the top. That's really cool, that, the flipper thing. You know, one of the things I've seen with a lot of teams is that they'll just kind of run it through their, uh, their shooter or something like that. Yeah. How did you come up with having the flipper where it's actually going to come uh, like out of this uh, small opening you have? So one of our priorities is we wanted to be able to shoot balls in succession pretty quickly. And we figured that if we ran the opposite color ball up through our shooter, we'd have to return the shooter to the correct position. And so by flipping it out through our intake, we saved the time and the effort of turning the turret and whatever so that it would not make another point for the phone. So before we hand it off the ground, how does it get into the uh, shooter area? Tell us more about um, that. So we have in here our conveyor. We have some we have some pretty neat rollers. They have a little ridge. They're 3D printed and covered with surgical tubing to help grip the ball and send it through. The ridge is supposed to center the ball, so it makes it through in a straight line. We also have beam brake sensors to be able to tell how many balls and where they are in the robot so that we don't like over intake. Um, and it just sends it up straight through to the shooter. Well, let's pass it over and talk more about the uh, shooter process and the turret. You guys got such a huge turret uh, on your robot as well, too. So tell me more about everything that's gone into it. So the turret was the thing that we really had to design the robot around. We have a, a Neo, we have a Neo down here, and it feeds into our gear driving system. This gear drive is uh, connected to an encoder, so we know where the turret is at all times. But then there's this giant belt that reaches through the inside of the turret. And one thing you'll notice when we talk about our shooter, it's all 3D printed. We used um, Mark Forge's Onyx to give us some extra strength, and we've had no issues with it whatsoever this entire season. Uh, 
the turret itself has a lot of wires, and we wanted to make sure that we had at least a 360 degree turret for this season. We ended up with a 420 degree turret, and uh, to manage our wires though, we had to use this IGUS chain. So this IGUS chain allows the wires to uh, stay perfectly how we want them and how we set them originally. And uh, this just keeps wires from getting damaged throughout the course of the season as this turret is flipping back and forth multiple times per match. The downside of this IGUS track, though, is it's super wide. And we had to widen our whole entire robot just to fit it in. So that's why you'll notice that we're not the typical 30 by 30 or yeah. some, um, num some set of numbers that add up to 30 by 30. We've actually chamfered our corners. So our robot at its frame measures 32 by 34 inches due to this. Uh, moving on to the, to the shooter itself, we have two sets of wheels in here. We have our yellow kicker wheel down in here, and we have our black uh, shooter wheel. So the black shooter wheel is driven by two Neos, and uh, the kicker wheel is driven by a single Neo. And the idea of the kicker wheel is that we're always getting the same force put into our wheel every time, and the ball's already at least somewhat up to speed to reduce the shooter wheel from slowing down. One thing you will notice about our robot is that we don't have the uh, wheel here at the top like so many other teams did this season. We chose to embrace the backspin and uh, hit that really top lip of the hub every time we shot. We also have an adjustable hood turret as well, so there's a lot of variables when it comes to tuning this thing. Uh, this just allowed us to have some extra precision when shooting, things like that. When you were looking, uh, you, you talked about having the backspin for what, like it sounds like a chicken and egg thing. So what came first, hitting it on the lip of the uh, hub or having the backspin? Uh, the backspin, technically the weight came first. Uh, where our robot's 125 pounds and we didn't really have a lot of extra room for to put that extra mechanism up here. So the compromise was we had backspin. Um, Luckily, we were able to accommodate for this backspin and just hit the lip of the hub rather than what a lot of teams have been doing, which is just sending it on a really high arcs parabola. Yeah, it's been working out great for your team, obviously. Three finalist wins under your belt, doing really well here at Kettering Kickoff. Uh, let's talk about your uh, climber, what's gone into that. Uh, I know in you know, a lot of match strategies, your team does stay on the field and shoots uh, near the end, but still love to hear about what's gone into your climber and how it operates. So, yeah, as you said, the climber, uh, we, we typically do like to shoot because we're only a high run climber. The original plan when we started this season was to go to the transversal bar, but as I mentioned earlier, weight was an issue. So uh, we cut down to a high bar, transver the high bar climb, and uh, it uses the same mechanisms that our transversal would. It just has some less strong parts, and uh, that d meant that it couldn't go up to the transversal bar. So. Aiden, if you want to send the climber up. So we have four stages to the climber from the driver's perspective. The first stage is that we go to the height of the low bar. So here we can drive into the low bar, and uh, if we wanted to do a low bar climb, we could from this height. If we go up one side further, we'll go to the middle bar. Now we have a lot of sensors on our uh, climber. We have some uh, distance sensors up here, and I will trigger one. From this position, our climber arms then swing up to reach the high rung, and then the driver will drop the robot so that it swings down to the high rung. Uh, we have a lot of safety precaution in place, which is why we can't show you that part of it, uh, mostly to keep our robot from dropping and damaging its chassis. But uh, yeah, so our climber will just swing these arms up and latch on. Let's wrap up on your robot. I'd love to hear more about, uh, I've seen that you guys are shooting on the move. I think that's really cool uh, for that. So uh, talk to me more about uh, why it's important to your team and anything you want to add on to uh, how shooting on the move works on your robot. Yeah, so for the moving and shooting, what we decided to do is first we figured out how to do it stationary. So we'd sit the robot down, we'd figure out what angle and what RPM at a certain distance, you know, can the robot efficiently score. And we'd do that in increments of around a foot. So after that, now we needed to you know, get it to work while moving. So what we do is, based on how fast the robot's moving, we basically make it think that it's shooting somewhere else. So you know, if it's moving forward, you know, we'll, we'll adjust for that by tricking it into shooting accurately. And that's all done based off of the limelight's distance. So we do a little bit of trigonometry to kind of figure out what our velocity is in relation to the um, goal. And once, once we figure that out, then we kind of you know, add uh, different amounts of distance to our lookup table, which we use to figure out um, hood angles and shooter uh, turret RPM. 
And then once we've done all that, then we have a final value that we can use to accurately move and shoot. Well, Punish 2451, thank you so much for taking time to tell us about your robot. Uh, been building great robots every year, so can't wait, of course, to see your performance here at Kettering Kickoff, but also looking for the future robots as well. Thanks a lot. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. If you're a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many FIRST alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. Continue your excitement of robotics at Kettering University with their combat robotics team and FIRST Center. Turn your robotics experience into a professional career. Find out more and get your application started at kettering.edu apply.